evening, this lecture with Rat Hashem will be Lerfuat Edna Bat Ahava and Lavdi Leilu Nishmat Malka Regina Bat Marcel Misodi. And also for Yair Ben Tatiana, with Rat Hashem, Aliyah Baruchaniyut, Chazara Bitshuva. In a night like tonight, there's so many things to say. It's hard to know, to choose the right words, what to say, what not to say. It's a very fragile time. When people's heart is uh, wounded and painful, the brain frees. When the brain frees, nobody can handle the truth. So I will try to be as sensitive as possible. For those of you who've been listening to me for years, I already prepared you for this day. You can't say I didn't tell you, I told you so. As a matter of fact, just last week in Queens, I spoke about the Israeli army, that it's, in a, it's a very low level army, not like they, they have great PR, but it's a very, very low level army. They make a lot of noise, but the Hamas is a better army than us. That's the truth, and also Hezbollah. Because the army is not technology. Technology helps, obviously. You can spy on people, you have good weapons, you have drones, you have things. By the way, they also have all of that with the help of Iran. But an army is the quality of the soldiers. And when soldiers are not afraid to die in a war, they actually look for it, you will always be inferior, always. You can never win an army that people train all day, all night, for years, just to kill Jews. That's it, they have nothing else in their life. They only train for that moment that they slaughter as many Jews as they can and they torture them. And uh, when the time comes, they're happy to come to the mission. Our army, with all due respect, I mean, yes, there are some great quality soldiers, you know, but there's also a lot of very spoiled soldiers. Soldiers of iPhone, soldiers of high tech, very soft, very gentle, lots of gays. They cannot handle a combat with such gorillas, such monsters. The cruelest people in the history of the world. Now I've been telling you for 20 years that these Arab terrorists are much worse than the Nazis. I know some of you doubted it. I'm sure you doubted it. And people even ask me, what makes you think they're worse than the Nazis? Maybe the same, but why worse? The answer is very, very simple. The Nazi will try to do as much as he can to torture and kill Jews. Just the same ideology. There's only one difference, and that makes a huge difference. What's the difference? The Nazis will do it as long as he doesn't have to get hurt. If you tell this Nazi, hey, Adolf, you can kill 100,000 Jews right now if you press this button, but you're gonna lose your left arm or your right arm. You're gonna have only one hand instead of two from now on for the rest of your life. He won't agree. He won't agree. Tell him you lose one ear. You lose one eye. You lose one leg. He won't agree. As much as he hates the Jews, he won't agree to sacrifice one finger from his body to kill a Jew. You come to these monsters, you tell him you have an opportunity to slaughter a Jew, you and your ten kids will die. He would grab the deal with no hesitation. And he will feel very lucky about it. So who is worse? Now you saw in front of your eyes what they did to the people. Took little children, two, three years old, put them in cages like monkey and laugh. I don't want to tell you what they did to the women. If you know what they did to these women, all these women they capture, you would cry for years, nonstop, for what they are doing, what they do to old people. 
how much they enjoy to murder. Who would ever believe that people that were created by God will become worse than any monster in the history of the world? Who would ever believe such thing? But after this opening statement, I would like to shift a little bit to the Torah point of view. I know you're going to be a little bit shocked now, but uh, we have to teach Torah, not politics. What I just said until now was politics. Now I'm going to say what the Torah say. The Torah say, there is only one who gives life and only one who takes life, which is the creator of the world, Kadosh Baruch Hu. How a person would end his life is 100% God's will. What you just saw what happened to these children and to these women and to these old people and to the soldiers and the civilians. This was written by Hashem on Rosh Hashanah, 100% by Hashem, without any assistance. This was 100% his decision. And also, it was his decision after tons of mercy. Meaning, if you saw 1,000 Jews are being slaughtered in one day, it could have been 100,000. But after Hashem did everything he could with his mercy to reach an agreement with the Satan, after all he's the prosecutor, this is how it ended. That means this was a plea bargain. It could have been a hundred times worse. What made it so far only a thousand? Hashem has his calculation. Maybe the righteous people who sit and learn Torah, maybe the Tehillim, Maybe the chesed that so many people do. Hashem has his calculation. But Hashem cannot do whatever he wants. Once he created a world with the justice system, the prosecutor has an equal power like the defense. So the defense, the angel of Israel, Malach Michael, Michael Sar Israel, is our attorney, defense attorney. And the prosecutor is the Satan, is also an angel, is a prosecutor, and very cruel one. He doesn't mix feelings, just like the prosecutors here in America or in Israel. They have zero feelings, they just want to convict you as deep as possible. Satan, the same thing. Anything he can use against you to get you to die and to lose your share to the world to come, be 100% sure that he's going to do it. We have to do everything to our, in our power and our free will to avoid such consequences. And the only way to avoid it is to be righteous. If we won't be righteous, it could have been 100% us. It could have been us. So for those of you who do not understand what I'm about to say, let me clarify myself. Many of you, and probably every Jew on earth today, besides the traders that brought all of that on us, besides them, besides the Erev Rav, every kosher normal Jew, even non-religious, people who love Hashem, love Judaism, care about it, they are full of rage right now. Sadness, 100%. The highest level of sadness. Disappointment, the highest level of disappointment. Broken heart, the highest level of a broken heart. Desperation, very high level of desperation. Hope is not in the highest level right now. But the worst thing out of everything right now is the rage. We are full of anger. Why? Because we were totally humiliated by the filthiest monster on earth. Barbaric monsters who are worse than any filth you can imagine. They humiliated us, they tricked us, they killed us like we don't exist. 
They made our army look like a joke. The whole world is shocked. How is it possible? Where was the army? The army did not start to respond at least four hours until already hundreds of people were murdered. In the, you go to Uganda, to Zimbabwe, they have already a better army over there. It won't take them four hours to respond. And all their show off and equipment and cyber. Everyone is in shock. I spoke to a few people who used to be in intelligence. They say if a mouse would touch the fence, 20 jeeps would get there in less than a minute. This is how strict it used to be. It has to be an inside job cannot be that they broke the fence in 15 places and broke in and nobody responded, not one bullet was shot. And then they occupied a military base that had tanks over there. And they took the tank and they drove over people. Do you know what it means? You drive in a car and a tank goes over you and smash you and make you, make your bones into powders. Do you know what a way to die? Like ISIS, that's ISIS used to do it to people make them run, and the tanks drive over them. It's probably, I don't know, 20, 30 tons. Grind every inch of you. After such a thing, what do you see on the floor? Like a piece of paper. There's nothing, you don't see skeleton, no spine, no nothing, no head. Smash everything, it's very heavy. With all the chains, that's what they did to people. Besides all the shooting and all of that. So we are full of rage. It's normal. But the rage comes from a very negative source. What's, what's the source? Heresy. Every one of us today that hates Arab more than yesterday, meaning Hamas terrorist, is an heretic. It's a kofer. Every one of us. I also have those moments that I forget myself and I forget the Ashkafa of the Torah and I get full of rage and then I, then I go back to reality knowing that it's no Hamas, there's no such thing. There's no Arabs. This is only the, the stick in the hand of Hashem. It's only Hashem. Hashem did this to us. Hashem did it to these girls, to these kids, to these old women, to the soldiers. Hashem decided that rockets would fall on our end. Hundreds of them every day, hundreds, thousands. Hashem decided that they will kidnap 150 people and torture them in a worse torture you can imagine that words cannot describe. And remember my words, this was after begging to the Satan to compromise on this only. I will prove my point to you. It's obviously not my point. I'm just telling you what the holy books are saying. If it would be a massive earthquake, just like in Morocco two or three weeks ago, thousands of people died there or in Libya. Within a week, in Morocco and in Libya, in each country, they had close to 10,000 dead. If 10,000 Jews would die from an earthquake in Israel, massive earthquake, in the south, same area, Sderot, those kibbutzim, we would be very sad, absolutely. We would be very disappointed, absolutely. Heartbroken, everything the same. But we wouldn't have rage. We wouldn't have who to hate. Who should we blame, Hashem, for making an earth with? We're not that brave to go into a war with Hashem. Besides that idiot who wrote the book, I didn't ask to come to the world, Normal Jews do not have the, the guts to start and declare a war against God, you know? So we, if there was a massive earthquake in Israel, we would feel very bad that we brought it on ourselves with our behaving. If Hashem decided to give us an earthquake and there would be thousands of buildings falling and so many people trapped and die, it would be a terrible disaster it will be even 100 times worse than what happened now as far as casualties and, and, and money loss. Because if you have 100 buildings falling down, that's right there, uh, billions of dollars. Right there, just the, the, the buildings. 
besides all the 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 the, the and the and and the chaos. But right now we are more more angry and more disappointed and more humiliated. Why? Because we blame the Arabs. We blame these monsters. Don't get me wrong. It's mitzvah to hate them. It's a big sin to feel any mercy on them. According to the Torah, you, we had to kill them a long, long time ago because the Torah says someone who planned to come and kill you with no mercy, you must kill him first. That's the law of God. And one of the reasons we are being punished for, for not doing it, because we are worried what the Europeans would say, or United States, or the rest of the hypocrite countries. Because we were worried about them and not what the Torah says, now we are paying and we eating what we cooked for ourselves. That's one of the many reasons why Hashem did this to us. We cannot put the finger 100% on the main cause. But I can give you at least 100 reasons why it could have happened because of that. One of the, one of the things that happened, if you're familiar with the details, this happened on Shabbat and a holiday. Shmini Atzeret. When Jews gathered in the synagogues, the religious Jews, to dance with the Torah, to show appreciation and love to the Torah that we love so much, and we're so appreciative that Hashem gave us such a holy Torah and made us his children and made a wedding with us, which is such an honor to be a son of God, every one of us. The Christian made themselves one fake son of God. Two billion worship him. Some of them willing to die for him. Some of them dedicate their life to spread his nonsense. For one son of God, which was fake. We, every one of us, those who keep mitzvot, are children of Hashem. So it's a great honor to be a real son of God, or a daughter of God. So we want to show Hashem how much we love the Torah. Without the Torah, the Gemara in Masechet Erubin, in Amud Kuf, Masechet Erubin, page 100, the Gemara says over there, Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Ilmalei Nitna Torah, Ainu Lemedim Derech Eretz Ma'achatul V'Matar Negol. If we would not get the Torah, we would have to learn how to behave from the cats and the roosters. Meaning, it's a general way of saying, animals will have to teach us ethics. Animals will have to teach us ethic. ethics. So now we have Torah, so we learn how to become decent human being. So, you know, we want to show Hashem our appreciation. We dance with the Torah. Plus, in the holy books, it's written that the more you dance with the Torah, the more you show appreciation to the Torah, then you have more siyata dishmaya to learn a lot of Torah this year. It's like a cycle. We finish the Torah, it's a siyum. We restart it. So since you finish well, you start well as well. This is the concept of Simchat Torah. While the religious Orthodox Jews were in synagogues in Israel and the rest of the world trying to be happy with the Torah, there was a big party in the south of Israel with three to 5,000 people. There's all kinds of versions, how many people were there. But the lowest version I heard is 3,000 people. It's called Mesibat Teva an outdoor party. It's outdoor. They usually take either a forest or a desert. They bring a famous DJ somewhere from the world, you know, with this loud music, with a big stage. Almost everyone, almost, are full of drugs over there. People naked, full of tattoos, earrings in the nose, all kinds of you would, you would be shocked when you see what kind of teenagers go there. What do they want? To take drugs and jump for three days. They jump for three days. The drugs, this ecstasy that they take, and other drugs, makes them jumpy. Two or three days they jump. Drink and jump with the music. And the party started Thursday. They were supposed to go until after Shabbat, to Sunday. And on Shabbat morning at 6.30 in the morning, they were dancing all night. The party never ended. I don't know how the DJ, maybe there are few DJs, I don't know. 
keeps going. It doesn't stop for a minute. These people that take so much drugs, they have energy from the drugs to jump, 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 jump. Dance, that they call it dance. They all, almost all of them take off their shirts, they jump. If you saw videos, I'm sure you saw, you know what I'm talking about. At 6.30 in the morning where they don't know where they are, from the loud music. Basically, one of these guys that got saved from there described all the drug things and everything. From here I learned the details about the party. One of the participants who got a bullet in his elbow and in his knee, and he was one of the only survivors from three people that hid in some kind of a shed. They shot everyone, he got two bullets, but he didn't die. We described what the party was about. And all of a sudden, jeeps, pickups, full of terrorists with grenades and machine guns. They broke in 15 different places in a fence. They prepared one year for this operation. And parachutes, not regular that you jump from an airplane. The ones with the propellers, you know, like they go on a beach, see them on a the beach, they fly, they, 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 with a parachute, they, they, you know, they come, I don't know, about 10, 12 of them, they landed right next to this party, plus all the jeeps came, and they started to shoot the people. And of course, everybody started to run, and, and then, then they ambushed them from the other side as well. I don't know if their goal was the party, or they just got lucky to find thousands of people in one place. I'm sure they, the party was advertised everywhere for weeks. So it was a known thing, you know, over, all over the internet and social media. Probably they knew about that party, so maybe they planned the date based on that. Of course, it's all Hashem. Hashem decided in Shemini Atzeret that's what's going to happen. We will try to understand why in a minute, but that's when they already killed 300 people right there. Within two, three hours, first 300, and captured 150. They took them to Gaza. And from then on, you don't want to know what happened to them once they got there. And then they started, they had a plan to attack 22 Moshavim, 22 community towns. And they attacked 20 and occupied the place. They occupied the military base of, of the Israeli army, killed everyone there, took all the cars and the tanks, they occupied the police station of Sderot, killed all the policemen there. Dozens of policemen, they killed all of them on Shabbat, and they occupied the building. And they occupied 20 out of the 22 cities that they had in their plans. Two towns were saved completely. They couldn't enter. Do you know why? There were religious places. They closed the gate on Shabbat. No cars going in and out. The Hamas published a video how they were trying to come in and they couldn't move the gate. They gave up. They started to scream, let's go, let's go. From the 22 places, 20 were not religious. They went there and murdered so many and injured so many and kidnapped so many. Disaster. The two places that the gate is open, closed for Shabbat and people there religious, they did not enter and nothing touched them. Now I want to tell you a story that is all over the news. I don't know if you listen to the news. It was on the radio. It was all over the WhatsApp groups. Me and my supporters, those who helped me to do my uh, Elul trip every year. So the highlight of my trip is always the seminar, the wicked seminar that we do in a Jerusalem Garden Hotel. We made many, many seminars, and we made from those seminars hundreds of new Shomrei Shabbat, hundreds, over the last 10 years. A lot, Baruch Hashem. So the last seminar in Elul, you know my lecture about Shabbat. After you listen to this full lecture, it's very, very difficult to stay not Shomer Shabbat. Very difficult. Because they hear things they don't hear anywhere else about the severity of, of being a Mechalel Shabbat. 
So a huge percentage of the listeners immediately accept on themselves never to be Mechalelei Shabbat. There were two girls over there, two Israeli girls in the early 20s, not Shomer Shabbat, but in a seminar, Baruch Hashem, they decided after what they saw, that's it. From now on, we are Shomer Shabbat. But it's still secular, you know. They only Shomer Shabbat three, four weeks from Elul until now. But it's still secular. But they also accepted on themselves modesty, to dress modest. And what secular girls do? They go to those, to those parties. Not all, but some. So the girls say, what are we going to do? The highlight of the party is on Shabbat, when everyone is off. That's when it becomes packed. Thursday, Friday even more. But Shabbat is the main thing. So what are we going to do? They say we accept it to be Shomer and Shomrei Shabbat. That's it. We cannot go on Shabbat. So what do we do? We're going to go on Thursday. And we leave Friday. Some of you got it. I sent it to, you, to your WhatsApp, to the WhatsApp group. Those who are on the group, they could hear the girls saying the story. So they decided to go on Thursday to the party and leave Friday morning. It's all the way in the south until they get home. On, on Friday morning, Remember, they were up all night. So 6.30, you don't even know that it's early morning, because you are already up from Thursday non-stop in the party. So they say, okay, let's leave. Friday, we have to leave. So they decided to leave. They decided to leave, and they had three more girls with them. The two girls that became Shomre Shabbat, they had three more girls, their friend, that were not in a seminar. They say, we're leaving, you have to come with us. Don't stay, Shabbat, this, that. Shabbat and holiday. Five girls got on a road. As they driving, they started to hear gunshots from the back. Boom, boom, boom. Thousands of bullets per minute. Many terrorists. A thousand terrorists, Rabotai. Thousand terrorists. It's not some kind of a small terror organization. That's a massive army. Thousand terrorists with loaded with 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 weapon. So as they left, they just passed, and the army closed the highway. Nobody goes in and out. They don't want the terrorists to go outside of the area. They want to surround the area and start checking what's going on. So if they would stay five more minutes in a party, they would all be dead or in Gaza now having the biggest nightmare of a woman. You get it. What, what, what happened to the girls over there now? So those girls, she spoke on the radio and she said about the seminar, it was a big Kiddush Hashem, she mentioned my name. When she came to the seminar, and they became Shomrei Shabbat, and they have no doubt the Shabbat saved their life. So everyone who sponsored the last trip to Elul, and mainly the seminar, can put in his file for the Olam Abba that they saved five Jewish girls from massacre, or from even worse than that. Now imagine these girls, they get married, they have children, they put them in yeshivot, it will be maybe 30, 40, 50, 100, after two, three generations of Shomrei Mitzvot. Every mitzvah they keep will go to the sponsor's account forever and ever. How many millions of times I have to say that's the best investment? Best investment. There's nothing comes near it. So the girl got saved. So we had the schut to save Chamesh Neshamot, five Neshamot, that will be dead now, or worse than dead. To be kidnapped is worse than to die. If you're kidnapped by civilized people, they care about international law, there's no torture, they give you food, nobody abuses you. Okay, at least you're dealing with people, not with monsters. This is uh, the devil. These Palestinian mass murderers are worse than the devil. The devil is not cruel like them. Like I said, the Nazis are not cruel like them. As cruel as they are, 
they are worse. And we are paying now the price of 30 years having mercy on these monsters. The lefty among us gave them power, fought for them, did PR for them, made us look very weak. What some of the terrorists that were investigated, that they caught them, they say we got encouraged by the lefty to attack. The lefty gave us the strength to attack Israel, clearly. I've been saying it for 20 years. The terrorists say, we saw what the lefties do in Israel. We saw the traders inside Israel and how they make everything a chaos and they make the army weak. And we realized this is our best chance. But we never dreamed to have such a success. We are shocked that for hours we've been killing people and nobody showed up. Nothing. Not when we broke the fence. Not when we landed. Not when we've been killing people for hours and nobody showed up. So people who know a little bit military, they all swear that it has to be a conspiracy with traders from inside. I wouldn't be even 1% surprised. I've been saying for 20 years who the real enemies, those who are among us. I've been saying it clearly, openly. You can't stand it when they hear it, but that's the truth. So now all of a sudden, they think, what should we do? What should we do? Oh, now you're asking, what should we do? For me, it was obvious on Rosh Hashanah, in the middle of davening in Rosh Hashanah, I was thinking to myself, what will be the response of Hashem for the horrible year we had last year? So much Lashon Hara, division, hate, religious, not religious, all kinds of different groups. So much dirty cursing and so many demonstrations and abusing and how much Hashem can take. The Satan had a very solid case against us. Couldn't be more solid. Didn't have to convince. Just collect all the messages on Facebook, Instagram, on all the articles and all the WhatsApp groups. Just collect the billion messages that the haters of Hashem left online. And that's enough already to bring a Holocaust on us. Not just a massive tragedy. I mean, you saw what happened. A thousand people and broke us completely. Smashed our hearts. As a matter of fact, since the Holocaust until today, there was no day in the history of the Jewish nation that so many Jews were murdered in one day. We had another tragedy in the Yom Kippur War, 50 years, exactly 50 years ago. More than 3,000 people died, but over a period of few weeks, not in one day. Every day, another 50, another 100. You know how it is in a war. But it never been from the Holocaust. The Holocaust, they killed tens of thousands every day or more. Obviously, it was a genocide. But here, in a day, a thousand dead people within one day from morning to night never ever happened from the Holocaust until two days. That means it's safe to say that it's the biggest nightmare we ever had. Just like the United States had September 11, and Japan had the big earthquake, and now the Moroccans have the earthquake, and other countries have their own tragedies. This is the biggest nightmare we had from the Holocaust until now. It's very sad that now every Simchat Torah will be the yard side of so many people who were murdered. Think about it. Every, every Simchat Torah will still have this burden in our heart to think about this big tragedy. Why did Hashem wait for Shmini Atzeret? Why Hashem waited? You can replace me, I don't mind. I don't want to miss one second. No, I know, I mean, I admire you. I mean, I understand. But you know what, you know one thing, one thing you should know. Whenever your phone rings or acting out, the Satan always makes sure you get confused. You don't know how to shut it. 
It's always like that. I once went to a synagogue somewhere on Shabbat. I had Shabbat on there. So they had a youth minyan and a bigger minyan of the older people. And the, the rabbi over there, if you can call him a rabbi bichlal, so, you know, on Shabbat, Mincha, one guy came with a motorcycle, leather jacket, take off his helmet. Shabbat, an hour before end of Shabbat, Mincha, in a synagogue, 700 people in a shul, took off his helmet, parked the motorcycle right by the entrance to the shul, walks in with his phone tied to his belt, Everybody saw that he just came with a motorcycle, showed up, Mechalel Shabbat, Befaresia. And that fake ran to him. Aliyat Shlishi, Bechavod. I'm the guest speaker over there. My blood started to boil. I came to him and said, you're not allowed to give him Aliyah. You're not allowed to give Mechalel Shabbat Aliyah. It's against the Halakha. It's against, against Rambam, Shulchan Aruch. Against almost all the Puskim. How you do such thing? Chaser Shomrei Shabbat Give him Ptichat Ha'echal. Give him Otsat Sefer Torah. Give him Agba'a. Why you have to give him Aliyah? Ah, we are not makpid over here about this. We don't care about this halacha, basically. That's what he said. When the guy got up to the Torah, he said the bracha, and what do you think happened? His phone started to ring, but his phone wasn't a regular ring. It was a rap music with curses. Cha-cha-cham, pa-pa-pam, ta-ta-tam, you know what they call hip-hop. You know hip-hop, every word is a curse there. And so loud, so loud, such a chilul Hashem, the Torah is open, and this dirty music, and what happened? For five minutes. He cannot shut it. I said to, the, to that faker, I said, Magia Lecha, it's all your fault. This is Hashem's opinion about you. Hashem made the phone ring. If he would ring uh, 10 minutes later, no one would know about it. It would already be out. He <laughs> made it ring in the middle of Aliyah La Torah, in front of 700 people, the older Shomrei Shabbat, they're all shocked. What's going on here? It came like a disco bar. That's what happened when you're not makpid. So, Rabotai, now the question is where are we going from here? It seems like maybe life will not be the same. There is really no return to the way things used to be. After this big explosion, we do not really know where we're heading. We erased the generation in Israel and in America that have zero knowledge and zero connection to Hashem. Zero knowledge and zero connection. Zero. There are millions of Jews in the world who do not know to name one mitzvah even. They have no idea. Some of them did not even perform circumcision. And this part of the Rabotai, if you see the video, there was a big, big, huge statue of Buddha. And everybody danced around. Don't get me wrong, they didn't come to worship Buddha. They don't even know who Buddha is. These Israelis who jumped. Whoever organized the party found it necessary to put the biggest idol of the Buddhist for whatever reason. I don't know why put a huge statue of this god of the Buddhist, Buddha, and it looks terrible, like, like the golden calf. Everyone dances around it. I'm not saying that's the reason that Hashem sent a thousand terrorists to start murdering the people that were dancing there. Like I say, there could be a thousand reasons why. It can be what happened in all the fighting the entire year before. It can be other reasons. We don't know. Only Hashem knows the final reason. Like they say, Akash Shavaret Gava Gamal. 
you know, in the language of the Torah, in the Gemara, it's called Igdish et Asea. You have a container, and every time you commit a sin, what happened to the container? It just grow. It, the level is raising, raising, a little more, a little more, a little more. It keeps going up. If you do an act of charity, big thing, it goes down. You fast, you repent, it goes down. You pray with devotion, it goes down. Yom Kippur, it goes down a lot. Depend if you repent. But every little sin, needless to say a big sin, it raised very fast and very high. Sins, it's not by quantity only, it's by quality. One sin, the Rambam say, can be equal to a thousand small ones. One mitzvah can be equal to a thousand small mitzvot. So sometimes a person will have literally less sins, but each one of his sins is so huge that his container was full by age 40, he's already up to the top. And the other one is already 80, and it's still not up to the top. Why? Because his sins are not as big. For instance, Shomer Shabbat, he eats kosher, he does the main things. He has other things. Once the level comes to 100%, the person must die that second. He cannot survive another second. Cannot survive. That's called Igdish Tasea. Igdish means Gadush. Gadush means Male, full. Igdish Tasea, meaning that's it. So what do Hashem do? Sometimes Hashem, before the person reached a level of 100, is in 98, 99 now, He gives him a massive heart attack. Six months in hospital, losing his business. The suffering of the next six months will bring the level down back to 50% or, for, or 60. It will give you an extension of another 20 years of life or 30 years of life. Why? Because suffering is the biggest tool to erase the sins. If you accept the, suffer, the suffering with understanding and no complaint. No complaint. The, the Midrash it gives us uh, three reasons why HaKadosh Baruch Hu brings suffering on a person. Three different reasons. For instance, one of, the, one of the parables the Midrash gives is there are two cows. person has two cows. One fat and strong. One is skinny and weak. Who would the person put all the weight on, on the back of the fat, strong cat, a, a cow, or a skinny, barely walking cow, on the healthy one? This parable has a nimshal. What's the nimshal? The good, healthy, strong cow is the righteous Jew. The skinny, dirty, weak cow is the wicked Jew. When Hashem has a righteous Jew and a wicked Jew, who is he going to put the suffering into his life? To the one who one little thing will make him commit suicide? He doesn't want to get up from bed and start taking drugs? He cannot understand suffering comes from Hashem. And looks at it as bad luck. Why me? It's not fair. I don't want to leave. Boom. Kills himself. The tzaddik, he knows Hashem is testing me. So I'm honored to carry the weight of Hashem on my, on my back. Then the, the Chachamim gives other examples in the Midrash. I don't want to make it long, but the conclusion from the three parables that they give, that there are three reasons why Hashem gives a person suffering. One is to make the person goes to a higher level. It's called nisayon. Nisayon means nes. Nes means elevation. Laharim al nes. It elevates you. After the suffering, if you pass the test, Hashem opens you a whole new world. 
of options that you could never had before. Never. The, the, the abuse you had or the shame that you got, the shaming that people gave you, the suffering you had to go through an X, X amount of time, or a few years without having children, you, you try, you run, you have one disappointment after the other, but you don't complain, and you say, Hashem, thank you for everything. Once you finally get the children, it could be the best on earth. Then, uh, then you say, wow, it was worth every second I waited. Why? Because this is the way of Hashem. First, to be very strict with a person, and later, to help him that this suffering actually helped him personally. One other reason is, like I just gave an example with the two cows, to make the righteous person take all the suffering on himself and avoid it from the weak people. Why? Because the weak people are not strong to handle the suffering. They'll break. So the tzaddik takes upon himself a lot for the sake of the generation. Of course, later on Hashem will reward him for every second of suffering. He's going to earn a big reward for that. He's not doing it for free. But that for the time being, he's carrying on his shoulder the weight of many other Jews around him. And there is a third reason, the conclusion from this Midrash Rabbah, is that Hashem brag, brag to the Satan, who is the prosecutor against the nation of Israel, look what unbelievable children I have in my world. Look how they take the suffering without making one beep. Look how for the worst that they can, you can imagine, that I test them with, they say, thank you, Hashem. And we have a pasuk for that. Odecha Hashem, ki anafta bi. I'm thanking you, Hashem, today for all the suffering you gave me in my life. Now when I understand how good it was for me, how beneficial it was for me. This is what's written in Psalms, in Tehilim. Az, az ima lesechok pinu, ulshonenu rina. There will be a time when we will understand all the secrets of the creation and all the reasons why people die and all the reasons why righteous people suffer and all the reasons why wicked people enjoy and celebrate and all the reasons why Hashem sent this filthy monster terrorist to torture us every second of our life. Never give us a moment of break, this Ishmael, from the minute he was born until today. We suffer for 3,500 years from these Arabs. And they're not going anywhere. A second before the Messiah would come, they would still be busy torturing us. The Midrash said that when the Jews came through the desert, to the wilderness, Arava, why they call Aravim? Because they live in a desert. Desert in Lashon HaKodesh is Arava. When you drive to a lot, you have a lot of desert in the south of Israel. What's the name of the road? Kvish Arava. The highway of the desert. Arava means desert, open desert. There's nothing there besides some thorns and bushes. That's where they are, Ishmael. The Torah says, Pere Adam. It's not a human being. He's a wild beast. The creator of Ishmael wrote in a Torah, in a manual. You know, every creation has a manual. You buy a stove, it comes with a manual. You buy a car, it comes with a manual. You buy a laptop, it comes with a book. Explain, instructions. The manual of Hashem is the Torah. Torah, Milashon Orah, instructions. Ishmael came to the world and God wrote, Ishmael Pere Adam. A wild monster, a wild beast. Ah, not me, don't say, oh, you're racist. No, 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 not racist at all. I have no problem with people, not by their color, or not by their accent. I love them all. I just love the righteous and hate the wicked, regardless if they're white or black, or oriental, or doesn't matter, Jews, non-Jews. 
I just love positive, righteous people. Don't get me wrong, everyone commits sins. I mean, we people, we have desires. We commit sins and sometimes too many. But there's a difference between someone that has a weak character and is searching for physical desires, like smoking, like eating sometimes not so kosher meat, like intimacy that is forbidden, and things like that. There's a difference between someone who does that and later regret it. Because the only reason he did it, not because he wants to declare a war against Hashem, or to dismiss the Torah, or to modify the Torah, or to redefine the laws of nature, or to redesign the world to make it Sodom and Gomorrah. No, those are big criminals. We're not talking about this kind of people. We're talking about an ordinary Jew, a girl that has a big desire to dress things that are attached to the body. Ah, it's, it's a scared, but it's not kosher. But the Yetzirah drives her crazy. The women that finally decided to cover their hair with a wig and they make sure that the wig will sweep the floor when they walk in Queens. When, when, they, when they designed such a thing called a wig, nobody had in mind a wig that is sweeping the floor when you walk on the street. They had in mind something synthetic, short, not attract so much attention. Many rabbis are totally against it. Even mothers, even synthetic, totally against it. Scream very much about it. But those who allowed it never had in mind the kind of wigs that women wear today. Is it better for them to not cover their hair at all? It's still better to cover with the wig. Because covering, covering the hair has two reasons. One is modesty. And second is that the natural hair of a married woman would not be displayed in the eyes of any man besides her husband. So when a woman wear a non-kosher wig, she fail the first purpose, which is modesty. She's not modest. She has fail in, when it comes to this category. However, no man see her natural hair. So she has 50%, it's better than zero. She walks with the hair not covered at all, she fell on both categories. At least now she fails only on one category. No. So, Abotai, so people who, it's, the Torah has a, has a name for it. Someone who commits sins, leteavon, has appetite, and his appetite sometimes for food, forbidden food, forbidden women, forbidden money, forbidden job, you know, many things are forbidden, but the desire say, come on, do it, only this time. Soon Yom Kippur, you will ask for forgiveness. You'll fix it later on. Yeah, you know, so those are a category of sinners, but they are still lovers of Hashem. It, hates them, it bothers them very much when people make a mockery out of the Torah. It bothers them when religious people are being abused and tortured in Israel. It bothers them to see the lefty liberals, how they betray God and the Torah and the nation of Israel. It bothers them. You may come and say to them, hey, you're nothing better than this lefty. He's Mechalel Shabbat, you are Mechalel Shabbat. He's a thief, you are a thief. He's not modest, you are not modest. He's, a, he's you know, has all these issues, you have all these. What makes you think you're better than him? He is better than him. Why? Because it bothers him to see things are being done against Hashem. Even when he does it. The Gemara says, If in the middle of the scene you suffer, knowing what you do is wrong, so you cannot fight your desire in one hand, but on the other hand, you know what's waiting for you. You're going to have to deal with the consequences of this bad choice it takes away the good taste from the sin. One father wanted to, to teach his son a good lesson for life. So he asked him, son, do you know what is the difference between cold water and a sin? The son knew that his father is a very clever man. If he asks such a question, it has to be deep. But he could not see any connection between cold water and, and a sin. So the father said, let me demonstrate to you the difference. He pushed him right into the 
cold freezing water. There was a lake, in Israel you have a lake, it's called the Banyas River. Freezing, the, you know how you take ice and you melt it? How cold the water are right now? That's how frozen it is. Very, very cold, like the Mikveh Ari. I think that's where the water comes into that Mikveh in Tzfat. It's extremely cold, you get a heart attack. If you jump in one shot, it can lock the, the heart. That's how dangerous it is. So what happened? The father pushed him into the cold water and he screamed, oh! And then the father grabbed him out and gave him a warm towel that just came out of the dryer with a good, great smell, you know? All this laundry detergent smells like paradise. And a warm, nice, good, thick towel. He wrapped himself and the son say, ha. Ah. So the father say, okay, now get the point. You know what's the difference between cold water and a sin? I'll tell you what's the difference. In a cold water, when you fall into cold water, first you scream, oh! Then when you come out, you say, ah. In a sin, you first say, ah. Then you say, oh, forever, forever and ever. Make sure you stick with the cold water. Leave the sin alone. Do you get the point? So, Abotai, many people think that the worst is behind us. I hope, I hope so. I really hope so. But, because we, are, we have a government that are almost all of them are lefty, and some of them are innocent lefty, that's the ideology, communist lefty people, that's how they were raised. But some of them are real traders, real traders. Because the government and the army is run by such wicked people, this is what they're going to do. They're going to get 100,000 Israeli soldiers, including all the, the, the reserve, and force them to go into the streets of Gaza when they have thousands of booby trap and snipers on the building and bombs under the ground, which when they press with remote control, and they're going to kill thousands of our soldiers just for one reason, because we do not want to wipe out these filthy murderers and throw five million bombs on their head and wipe them all out. Just like the Torah say to do. You tell the civilians, you have three hours to pack your stuff and run. We're starting with one line after the other. First, we wipe out all the first line of buildings, then the second. Then the third, until there's now one building left in this place called Gaza. There's nowhere to live. And then we occupy the whole place, and we make a serious electric fence. Good one, not like the junky one that was just broken with the tractor. And that's it. And there's no more Gaza. And if they threat now, if we continue to bomb them, they're going to execute every hour another kidnap prisoner. You tell them, try us. That will make sure that we will not leave one of you alive. The problem is that we don't have such leader. If I was there, I would not hesitate a second. That would be my orders, regardless what the world's saying. We'll deal with the world later. The world have short memory. A year later, no one would remember. If the war in Ukraine will finish, in one year from now, everyone would, rust to, or would run to kiss up to Putin and kiss his feet. I promise you that. They did it with Gaddafi. They did it with many other dictators. Everyone ran to kiss up to them. So the world have, it's all politics. Assad, everybody wanted to hang him. And in the end, United States kept him in power. Okay, stay. And they even met him. The Arabs, the Arab world, they put him on a ban. A year ago, he was invited to the Arab League, like nothing happened. He gassed his own people, half a million people. He killed half a million citizens of his country. His, his own people, Syrian citizens. 
Half a million killed. And what happened? Like nothing happened. They brought him back. Why? It's all based on what we want right now. What happened before, let's forget it. Plus, anyway, it's in the hand of Hashem. Hashem runs the world, not the United States, no one else. I want to remind you that the Hezbollah has 250,000 missiles and they're all aimed to one country only. Which country? I'll let you guess. There's only one problem. Right now, the Arabs shooting rockets. How big are the rockets? 10 foot long. 10 feet. 8 feet, 10 feet. And that's maybe one foot wide, or maybe one and a half. Those are the rockets. The missile the Hezbollah has is all the way from here to the glass door. This kind of missiles. And it's more than 10 feet wide, 12 feet wide. Every one of these missiles, Shalom, if it falls in any city in Israel, can bring down thousands of dead. Multiply by 250,000 missiles. Remember a few years ago I said, what's the reason they didn't shoot it? Who can do anything to them? They all live in a bunker. They can't even bomb them. Hezbollah built a terror city under the ground. There's no way to bomb them. You can throw five million bombs on them. They are under the ground, three, four floors under the ground. They're safe. There's no way to get to them. They go right into the bunker. All they have to do is to shoot every minute 10 missiles from 10 different places. 10, and another 10, and another 10, and another 10, and all of us will be dead. But Hashem did not sign on it on Rosh Hashanah. But now, all the naive people that have uh, false security, they think, ah, nothing will happen. When we get to the bridge, we cross it. Maybe it's time to change mode in your ideology. It can happen, and it can happen faster than you can think. If the Holocaust happened, everything can happen. If what happened in the last few days happened, then you know everything can happen. If the Hamas, would have more power, instead of sending a thousand terrorists, to send a hundred thousand terrorists, and they don't even, they're not even afraid to die, you wouldn't have a thousand dead. You would have two hundred thousand dead in one day. So, Hashem did not write on Rosh Hashanah two hundred thousand dead. He wrote one thousand as of now. We will see by the end of the war how, ma how many he really wrote. But this is what Hashem wrote. And now one person more than the number Hashem wrote can die, and not one less person. Less, it's only if people will repent before the time arrives for them to die. Even a minute before. If someone was in that party, for instance, and a poor, and a poor person would come back, some religious man, let's, this was Shabbat, so it couldn't happen, but let's say it would be not on Shabbat, not on a holiday. And one uh, religious man with a black hat would come over there and collect tzedakah. And one of these chilonim who jump with the drugs and the music would have mercy on that tzaddik and give him a hundred dollars tzedakah. That could have canceled his debt. And give him X amount of, has to, uh, and would give him X amount of a few more months to live, a few more years to live. That's what the Gemara said, tzedakah. Tatsil mimavet. That's why the best security is not life insurance. Life insurance doesn't benefit you. It may benefit your widow and your children, but not, it doesn't benefit you. What are you going to do? Take the million dollars with you to the next world? There is a much better insurance. Tzedaka would benefit you and your family. It keeps you alive. So it's good for them, good for you. Hopefully by then you will repent and all the sins will be erased. And that tzedakah that, that you gave brought you to life of eternity full of the greatest thing you can imagine. It's very possible that there are people now in heaven in the highest level and the reason they are there is $1,000 check that they wrote in their lifetime. Think about it. 
Maybe there were already moments before being wiped and go to hell for the rest of their life, forever. And one good thing they did in the last minute, a day or two before, Hashem gave them one final chance. And some Rosh Yeshiva came from Israel, back then, helped the Yeshiva. Okay, here is a thousand dollars. And Hashem said, he's not going to die this year. I'm giving him another five years. And in that five years, he got Torah and Science CD and became Shomer Mitzvot and went to Yeshiva and 20 years later became a big rabbi. And now he's in heaven for eternity. If you ask him in Olam Abba, what was the moment in your life that got you to heaven? Is that check for the thousand dollars. It could have been even a hundred dollars, depending on, on his budget. Don't ever underestimate any amount of tzedakah that you give. You don't even understand how critical it can be for your life. And that's the problem with people. When business is bad, when the economy is not so great, and their budget is starting to shrink, instead of increasing the tzedakah, the first thing they do is cut the money that they give. Why? I'm making half of what I used to make. So I'm cutting the tzedakah by 50% or more. That's the biggest mistake. What is it like? I'll tell you what is it like. Someone has a carriage with a horse, with four wheels, thick wooden wheels, and he drives with a, with a carriage and he got stuck in some swamp, sticky, muddy, muddy road. And he can't get, he cannot get the carriage out of the mud. No matter what he does. And there's tons of luggage in the, in the carriage. So what, do you, what does he do? Instead of start taking, I have 20 suitcases here, let me dump things that are not so important. If I have 20 pairs of shoes, let's get rid of 10. They're heavy. I can manage with one boot. I don't need another three. All right. Let's get rid of things that I can somehow survive without. I'll survive with what I can take. Otherwise, I'll be here forever. I must get rid of, of some luggage. But what does he do, this fool? He take off the four wheels out. Each wheel weighs 200 pounds. Very thick, big. You need two people to pick it up. So he disconnects the wheels from the, from the carriage. I say, what do you do, you idiot? I say, what? Well, look, I just saved 800 pounds from the weight of the carriage. Without the wheels, <laughs> he can't move an inch. That's the tzedakah, the wheels. If something can get you out of the swamp, is the increasing the tzedakah. Ah, but you don't have faith. That's the problem. You don't believe that Hashem is, in a second, can triple your, your budget. In a second. You don't believe in him. If you believe that I'm in, my, in the hand of Hashem, regardless how much money I saved, every day, whatever I need, Hashem supplied to me. So why being so conservative and making so many saving accounts and plans and retirement plans? What for? I'm in the hand of Hashem. It's a clear verse in the Torah. Hashem said to the Jews, do not leave man for tomorrow. Eat today and enjoy. Don't say for tomorrow manna. Tomorrow you'll have again what to eat. And the next day, and the next day. Count on me. But some Jews heard Hashem saying it, and they still put some on the side. And what happened? The next day it became all worms. Back then, you would see an immediate miracle. Today we don't have the merit. In a time of the desert, every five minutes you see a miracle. First, you see bread falling from heaven. Huge miracle. Then the well of Miriam is, tra is traveling with you and you get as much water as you want. That's a virtual well. Where is the water coming from? Obviously, it's a miracle. Just like the bread falling from, me from heaven, it's a miracle. Just like the split of the Red Sea, it's a miracle. Just like the clouds, and that's why we sit in a sukkah, the clouds. It's also a miracle. The clouds from the bottom is making the road straight. The clouds from the top giving you shade, saving you from all kinds of bad animals. Shivan and Ekavod, so many miracles. The clothes is growing with the children. You just had an infant, was just born. Five years later, he still wears the same shirt. No holes. 
Nothing get ripped. The, 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 the cloud comes and steam it and clean it from all the dirt. And the clothes is growing with them for 40 years and they did not need replacement. No tailoring, no nothing. Clear miracles in front of the eyes. It's all written in the Torah. No one would agree to accept the Torah when they read about these miracles that happened to them if one of those miracles did not really happen. Who would agree to accept it and say Naseh Nishma when he reads in a book such fairy tales that none of it happens to him? I would agree to become religious? You come and convince me that I'm getting bread every day from heaven? If it didn't happen, I would agree to become Shomer Shabbat? Or to stop with my nonsense? I would never agree. What made everyone becomes immediately so fanatic? Naseh Nishma. Whatever Hashem say we will do, every one of these miracles happened to them. So people are seeing clear miracles in front of their eyes. So you may ask, so why today we don't have such miracles? It's good that we don't have miracles or it's bad? It's good, it takes away the future. Depends who you ask. The answer, we're very lucky we don't have such a clear miracles. We're very lucky. It's Hashem's mercy that He reduced the level of miracles. We still have tons of miracles, don't get me wrong. But the miracles are hidden hermetically, completely. It's very hard to see it. You need divine eyes. You need to be educated in Torah for years to see the supervision of Hashem and the hidden miracles that happens to you every hour. Ordinary Amaretz, ignorant, cannot see it. Who, who can tell me why it's a good thing that we don't have such clear miracles? Miracles cost too much. The cost of a miracle is tremendous. I'll give you an example. We had now the biggest tragedy in the history of the State of Israel. Everyone agree on that? Yes. The biggest tragedy for one day. In uh, one incident in the desert, the Jews went to visit the pretty goyot, the non-Jewish girls. Not Moab. Hashem sent the pandemic. Within days, how many of them died? 24,000. There was one argument between one Chacham to another. Moshe Rabbeinu is a big Chacham, him and his brother Aaron. And Korach is a big Chacham, and the richest man in the world. Also Chacham, also for the tribe of Levi, he carries the Aaron HaKodesh. He comes from a very important royal family, just like Moshe, the cousins. And what happened in the end? He declared a demonstration against Moshe. 250 other leaders joined him. And what happened? 15,000 people died. Boom, in one moment. One moment. The, Hashem opened this, the, the, the ground and they were swallowed into the ground alive. And until today, the Gemara say, the Gemara was written 1,500 years after that incident. Even more, even 1,600 years after. The Gemara says, Eliyahu Hanavi showed Rabbi Barbarchana a place where he can hear Korach and his group screaming in hell. Moshe emet ve Torato emet. This was 1,600 years after the incident. This is the answer to those liberals who like to tell the wicked, ah, don't worry about hell. There's no such thing. It's written 133 times in the Talmud, but for those university rabbis, for some reason it doesn't exist in their Talmud. They make all kinds of metaphoric an analogies. You know what hell is? A little shame you get. Disappointment. But Chazal described Auschwitz, fire, cruel angels, people screaming from pain. People have no day, no night from the suffering. Just like the Jews had in Auschwitz, or worse even. For them it doesn't exist. Basically they're saying that Chazal are a bunch of liars. That's what they're really saying, without realizing probably. I don't think that's their intention. I want to give them the benefits of the doubt. 
But someone that come and say there's no such thing hell is the biggest hypocrite. You're not allowed to learn another minute of Torah from this person. It doesn't matter what kind of knowledge he has. Denying something that Chazal mentioned 133 times in the Talmud and say it doesn't exist, Rasha Merusha. Rasha Merusha. Even if he has good intentions, he called the wicked people. They're not worried. So, Korach and Adato were already 1,600 years in hell. What happened to the one year? Some of those Libras, they say, ah, oh, don't worry, even if there is a hell, it's only for one year only. What happened? Korach is already 1,600 years, was screaming in hell, Moshe Emet and Torah to Emet. If it was one year, it was supposed to be already in a much better place. So apparently it's not like they claim. What it's written is Mishpat Reshaim Bagenom Yud Bet Chodesh. Mishpat, a trial. That's why we say Kaddish for one year. Your father is being judged for one year. Every second of his life is being analyzed now in Shemaim. Then they decide if he goes to heaven or to hell or to Kafakela or who knows what else. So. Only? Regret. That's those who, are, who I'm talking about. They modify the Talmud, they modify the Jewish ideology. Some of them do it because they're just weak characters. They're afraid from criticism. Nobody wants a speaker that speaks about hell and what's going to be the end of the wicked people, especially when he tells it to them to their face. How many people can handle the truth? How many people appreciate a rabbi that tell them, if you won't repent, that's what's going to be your end. And it will be faster than what you can imagine. Most people are weak. They run away. They don't want to hear it. They rather someone who comes and tell them, oh, Hashem loves you. You don't have nothing to worry about. As you are, Hashem loves you. But it's a lie. It's against the Rambam in Elchot Shuvah. Rambam in Elchot Shuvah, chapter 7, Halacha 6 and Halacha 7. He described a person before he repent and after he repent. Before, it's literally written in a Rambam that Hashem cannot stand them, is hated, is despicable, and is abomination in the eyes of Hashem. I didn't write the Rambam. Rambam wrote it. Ilchot Shuvah, that's how we are judged. Ilchot Shuvah, laws of repentance. And today, after he already repented, is loved and welcome and close and Yadid, a friend of Hashem. It's such an honor. I'm your friend, not just your father. Who wouldn't want a father that is also his best friend? Give him everything and love him and bring him closer and he's much like his best friend. Most people don't have the merit to have such parents. They're not open with them. They resent them. They embarrass who the parents are, especially if they're primitive. Like one kid said to his father, when you pick me up, wait for me one block away. Don't come in front of the yeshiva. Why? My kids will make fun at your accent. Yes, some Russian accent came from Uzbekistan, Kafkaz, Russia. These American kids, you know, kids sometimes are a little silly. So he's embarrassed by his parents. Okay, he's a little kid. He doesn't get that much. But even older, when he gets older, he disrespects his parents and he thinks he's much smarter than them, even though they're usually ten times better than him, as they are not educated. The uneducated people who came to America are much more successful than all the big shot educated Americans today. Go to, to the Syrian community. They came here about 200 years ago from Arab country, Syria, without one word in English. Half of New York they own. Already the, the inheritance go already five, six generations. There are people today who inherit their parents, who inherit their parents, who inherit their parents, already 150 years back. You can see their genealogy. They have some books. It shows you who was the grandfather, how he came. How many Bukharians came here, I don't know, 60 years ago, 50 years ago, without knowing one word in English, and they own 47th Street? 
on their own real estate and buildings. Their kids, best case scenario, are pharmacists making 90,000 a year. And then go to jail. Some of them. You know? So who is smarter? The one who has 30, 40, 50 million dollar cash but his English is broken? Or his educated academic son from the best college in America who makes like an Uber driver who came here a year ago from Lebanon? Who? It's all depend how you look at things. It's all depend how you look at things. When they brainwash the people that to be academic it's good, that's their God. The academy it's their God. When you educate your kids that all academy it's like the peel of a garlic compared to one word of Torah. One word, any word from the Torah you take out. Even the word Esav. Take it out of the Torah, put it on a scale, Take all the academy from day one until today, and the word, one word from the book of God is already greater than all their wisdom combined. Any secular wisdom. By the way, a lot of these secular studies, it's also Torah. Geometry, mathematics, it's a part of the Torah. What do you think? The laws of nature, it's a part of the Torah. Some of the halachot is based on mathematics. Is based on physics. Like for instance in Ilchot Shabbat, when you have to pour cold water into hot water, who is going to cook who? The bottom water or the top water? Which water has more power to affect the other water? The water that was already in a cup or the water that was spilled in one shot into the cup? So you have boiling water, half a glass. And half a glass of cold water, you want to spill it into the hot one. Who is going to overcome who? The Ilain or Tatain? The Gemara is discussing it. This is the laws of physics. Masechet Sukkah, you know how many things you have, calculation, Masechet Eruvin. It's a lot of math in the, in the Talmud. Gaon Mivilna, bring any mathematician today, the Gaon Mivilna will make a joke out of him. And you know when he, when he learned his mathematics? The five minutes a day that I was in, his, in the bathroom. With a brain like the Gaon Mivilna, what you learn in five minutes, other people learn in a month. Even in yeshivas today, even in yeshiva, someone who has a very good, strong, sharp head can learn 20 times faster than an average guy. Gemara, 20 times faster. I know someone that became uh, religious and then made his cousin religious. The cousin, sweet boy, tzaddik, he was a young guy between jobs, so he said to him, why don't you go to the yeshiva? So he went to the yeshiva and he was full time in yeshiva. The cousin who made him religious and used to come only on Sundays. For how long? Two hours, three hours. Just to come to learn two, three hours every Sunday when he was off from work. In the two hours, he would learn more than what the other one learned the entire week. And the other cousin was like, I don't understand. You are here two hours. I'm here already six days from morning to night. How do you already know the page better than me in two hours what I learned here in six days? The answer, one has a very super sharp brain and the other one doesn't. In one page, it's already a weak difference. Imagine the whole Talmud. I saw in my own eyes a guy that came to our yeshiva 26 years ago from Venezuela. A Spanish Jew from Venezuela from Moroccan descent. Moroccans went to Venezuela, some of them. Uh, they arrived to Monsi. In two years that he was in yeshiva, he finished the whole Talmud, but not just finished. He remembered every word, every page, every Rashi, every Tosfot, everything in front of his eyes. In two years, he just came to yeshiva. He learned Hebrew, he learned Aramaic, while he was learning, and learned the whole Shas in two years. Ah, you are wondering, how can it be? Other person will take him 10 years. 
The answer is because he was the champion of South America in math. In math. He won the number one in the whole South America in a competition. So when you have the greatest mathematician in South America, or one of the biggest in the world, and he's already 22, 23 years old, and his brain works 100 times faster than an average smart person. That's a gift from Hashem. Someone with a head like this, it's a crime to do anything besides learning Torah. A crime. Ordinary people, it's not a crime and they don't, don't learn Torah. They go to work, they have some free time for the family. Someone with such a gift, how can you waste a minute? Everything you learn, you remember. Everything you learn, immediately you understand. After a few months, you connect all the dots. It opens to you like an like a, like a ocean of wisdom. Because the Torah has something unique about it. Mishpate Hashem emet tzadiku yachdav. The truth of Hashem, the, 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 the laws of Hashem are solid truth. But you can only see it when you know everything. Yachdav. You have the entire picture in front of your eyes. That's when you understand everything. If you only know portion, a little bit here, a little bit there, you have pieces from the puzzle is missing. The picture is not clear. Relatively, you have a lot of knowledge. But the knowledge is limited because what you don't know here, it's there. You, you have very important parts of the puzzle are missing. You know, on uh, Sunday was Simchat Torah, Shmini Atzeret, Simchat Torah. In Israel, it's only one day Yom Tov, it was Shabbat. By us, it's Shabbat and Sunday. You know, there was a miserable Sunday when the news started to come out from what happened in Israel. It was very hard to dance with the Torah, very hard to eat, very hard to smile. It was very, very difficult. But we have a very nice custom in Simchat Torah that we sell the aliyot, and the last two aliyot, before the maftir, are the most important in Simchat Torah. One of them is called Chatan Torah, and one of them is called Chatan Bereshit. Chatan Torah is the last aliyah of the Torah for the entire cycle of the year. From last Simchat Torah that we started Bereshit, the last words of the Torah, Le'ene Kol Israel is the last Ole La Torah. And the one who comes right after, who is he? Is Chatan Torah that he starts Bereshit Bara Elohim. Until Yom HaShishi Vayachulu HaShamayim Vaharetz, until Shabbat, that portion of the Bereshit we read on Simchat Torah. Then the following Shabbat we read the whole parasha of Genesis, Bereshit. Why we don't stop? We don't even say Kaddish between. The Kaddish is only after the second Ole. Why? To show Hashem we don't even stop a second. There's no such thing to finish the Torah. Immediately we anxious to restart it again. Who you usually give the Aliyah Chatan Torah? To the Rabbi. Rabbi, the, the biggest Chacham. If there's no Rabbi in that shul, you choose one that is, knows a lot of Torah. Who you give Chatan Bereshit to one of the important people in the community. As a macher, the president, someone who gives maybe the money, you know. And once he gets Chatan Bereshit, he also has to do Kiddush. In a big shul, there can be a lot of money to do Kiddush. You have 300 people in a shul. Usually in this case, they do the Kiddush in a house, and they invite only the house has X amount of room. But they have to do a Seuda. Why am I telling you this? So usually, in some places, they don't even sell. Automatically, they give it to the rabbi, and Chatan Bereshit, they give it to one of the people who contribute to the community. But some places, they sell it. People compete who should sponsor that aliyah for the honor of the rabbi, of the Chacham. 1,000, 3,000, 10,000, whatever. And everybody knows that they're not going up to the Torah. It's the rabbi. They want to contribute. Talk. There was one place somewhere in the world that the rich people 
were beating on Chatan Torah. Everyone was, his understanding was that they're going to give this aliyah to the rabbi. But there was one rich man, arrogant, disrespectful, who doesn't care about Chachamim. He wants it for himself. I am the rabbi. He's a total Amaharetz, barely knows how to read. He wants to be Chatan Torah. And he bought it. He has a lot of money, so he bought the Aliyah. He goes up to the Torah. Everybody laughs behind his back. Why such a fool wants to grab the title that he doesn't deserve to get? After he finished, the rabbi had to give a speech. And the rabbi said, why we call the Chacham, the rabbi that goes up to the Torah, Chatan HaTorah? The word Chatan means a groom. Groom can only be groom when there is a bride. Who is the bride? The Torah. The groom is the Chacham, and the bride is the Torah. The Torah also say that a person can never marry his bride before he check her out carefully, meaning he looks at her beauty, face, body, smile, skin, hair, everything to make sure that's his type. That's his taste. If you marry a, a woman that was delivered to you in a box, delivered from Amazon, you open the box, areat mekudeshetli. As a word. It's too much of a risk. Why? You have to check carefully who you're going to marry. So the rabbi say, a person is not allowed to marry a woman before he check her out carefully. But today in our synagogue, we, have a, we had a wedding that the Chatan never saw the Torah, the Kala before, the bride. <laughs> Meaning, he's full, never read one page in the Torah and he wants to be Chatan the Torah. Hinting. But maybe he's right. After all, Abraham Avinu also married Sarah without looking at her ever until he was 75. When Hashem told him, Lech Lecha, Lech Lecha, how old was Abraham? 75. Hashem hinted to him, When you be a hundred, you will have a son. Lech Lecha, Lamed, it's 30, in numeric value. Chaf, it's 20. Lecha, it's also. 30 and 20, 30, 20, 30, 20, 100. Hashem say, over here you cannot have a child. Meshane makom, meshane mazal. Change the location, your mazal is also changed. But you will have a son. But wait another 25 years. Today couples that get married, a year later, Rabbi, we have a big problem. We married already 12 months and my wife is not pregnant yet. Let her breathe maybe? <laughs> <laughs> Give a few minutes? No, no. No patience. Hashem said to Abraham, you will have a child. He will inherit you. When? In 25 years, talk to me again. So, when Abraham went with Sarah in front of the ugly Egyptians, they never saw in their life such a pretty woman. Because Sarah, every woman compared to her was like a monkey. Especially when in Egypt, Rashi writes that the people over there were extremely ugly. More than the usual countries. So therefore, you take the prettiest woman in the world, and you bring her to a country that all women there are extremely ugly, almost all. What is the first thing they do? Bring her immediately as a gift to the king. The world was very chauvinistic. There was no feminism yet. And also women's rights was not at its best. Immediately, are you married or single? If she says single, yalla, to paro. King, your majesty, look what I got for you. A tourist just came. Now why would Abraham say that she's not his wife? He says she's my sister. That's a guarantee that they'll take his wife and give her to another man. Who wants to live in a house knowing his wife is in someone else's bedroom? Better to die than to know such thing, no? 
But Abraham already knew that these filthy monsters, they are very cruel. They will kill in a second, but they will not dare to touch the married woman. So he knew they get rid of me in a minute. So what did Abraham say? She's my sister. What kind of a solution is that? Better they kill you than you see a wife going to kidnapped by, by this king. No? Better you die, go to heaven, what do you worry about? You want to be alive and see what they do to your wife somewhere in someone's house? The answer is, that's not what Avram said. Rav Eliashiv said, Avram said, she's my sister, but she's married to someone that did not come with us on a trip in a different country. You got it? If he would say, I'm the husband, tomorrow morning he'll be dead. They give him a nice grade, compensation. Once he say her husband is in Israel, he's a handicap, he cannot walk. So I came with my sister on a business matter. There's nothing they can do. Who would be such a fool to say, no, she's a single woman. You know exactly what's going to happen to her in a minute. So anyway, and Avram got a lot of gifts from Paro. But why am I telling you this? Because when Avram was 75, he said to Sarah, Taya Dati, now I know how pretty you are. Meaning until now, he never ever focused on her beauty. Such a modest, honest, righteous person didn't pay attention so much to materialistic things. So Avram, the rabbi say, here Avram, got married without checking his wife carefully before. So maybe our Chatan today is in the level of Avraham Avinu. We didn't know about it. Now you have to give an answer, he said. Who has an answer? Everyone was shocked. He said, I'll have the answer. What's the answer? Person has to look at a woman before he marry her if he cares about beauty. But if he's the Chazonish, or the Gaon Mivilna, or Rav Yashiv, this kind of people that have only one thing in their life that they care about is Torah. Nothing else they care about. Nothing. Not pleasure, not food, not women, not vacation, not nothing whatsoever. The only thing they have is Torah and Torah and Torah and that's all they talk about. They cannot talk even near them anything that it's not Torah. Someone like that can marry a woman without looking at her. What difference does it make? <laughs> Ordinary people like us, and even higher than us, they must check carefully. Why? Today, every person, besides very, very small exception to the rule, can count on one hand how many people in the world can get married without checking carefully who they marry to. Very, very few. Everyone must check a hundred times before. A hundred times. People are in such a low level today that if they will be married to someone they're not in love with and they're not happy to be with, intimately, physically, etc., they'll be the most miserable people in the world. And their life will be full of agony and pain and suffering and depression and sadness and lack of satisfaction. And it would lead to a lot of horrible things that would happen. Why? That's the level of the people today. Soulmate. Soulmate? We do not know who is our soulmate. We hope that the one we chose, it's our soulmate. But we don't know. Anyone here can swear 100% that we married is a soulmate? Swear on his life. Meaning if you are wrong, you die on a spot. Would you take that risk? <laughs> if yes, then you sure. I'm sure you sure. You may be wrong, but at least you're sure that you are right. But a smart person will not so fast jeopardize his life. By the way, the stipler, not me, the stipler, the holy stipler, the father of Rav Chaim Kanievsky, the stipler say that there are many people who married someone that is not their soulmate. They're not meant for each other. And, and 
they can have kids and be together 50 years. And they don't belong to each other according to Hashem's will. You may say, so how did Hashem let it happen? My answer would be, how does Hashem let a Jewish woman who married an Arab terrorist have 17 kids? When Hashem is furious at her every second of her life, can look at her. Such a traitor, such a wicked woman, sold her God, sold her nation, for what? Not to talk about the abuse she's going to get and the beating and all that. Why would Hashem agree that she become pregnant from such a monster who burned people alive and enjoy and laugh like they burned this woman? I don't know if you saw that video. One of the women that they caught in the party, they burned her on fire and they all stand around and laugh and clap. You see a woman is burning alive in front of you trying to put the fire off. You don't even get a, a little bit of regret. They stand over there and laugh and make jokes while she's burning in front of their eyes. Those are these Arabs, Hamas. Hamas, Jihad, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, same garbage. The last thing you want is to fall in their hands. I think it's better to go to hell than to fall in their hands. Really, no joke. Better. We'll get to it, don't worry. I'm still on, uh, I'm getting there. We're still in the introduction, if you didn't realize. <laughs> so, Rabotai, on Sukkot, we read in the middle of Sukkot, usually Shabbat, there is Shabbat Cholamoy. This year we didn't have it because Sukkot and Shmini Atzeret both fell on Shabbat. So there's no Shabbat in the middle. But usually it's not like that. Usually we have in the middle, in Chol HaMoed, Shabbat. That Shabbat called Shabbat Chol HaMoed. We don't read Parashat HaShavua. We have 54 chapters of the Torah that we read in the entire year. Sometimes we read two parashot. Gvayakel Pikudei. We read it together. Nitzavim Vayelech. We read it together. Why? So there are few Shabbatot that we read two parashot. If that's the case, we have 52 Shabbat Seir, 52. So how come it's not enough, 54? If there are few Shabbatot that you read two parashot, we should have been short. The answer is because some holidays fall on Shabbat, meaning on, on the holiday you don't read the parashat of Shavua, you read something else. So it's designed exactly that after excluding the holidays and the Chol HaMoed Shabbatot, if those 54 chapters will be divided to how many Shabbatot you read the parasha, and that's why some years you read two parashot together, and the year after you don't. Why? Because we have to divide them, that every Shabbat that is not a holiday, we read something from the Torah. Talk. So what do we read in Sukkot? in Shabbat Chol HaMoed. The answer, Zachary 14, Zacharia Yudalet. The end of the world. How the world will come to an end. What we call Milchemet Gog Magog. Why we read it in the middle of a holiday? We want to be happy. We sit in a sukkah. We sing Hallel with the Trogim. We dress nice. We eat nice. We go with the family, you know, some trips. Ma'achshav to go to read about Gog and Magog. Two thirds of the people in the world will die. Will be a disaster. People would run to hide in the desert. Describe a horrible disaster. Why we read it in the middle of Shabbat of Chol Hamoed, in the middle of the holiday? Because the Gog and Magog will start on the holiday of Sukkot. Now Shmini Atzeret is the eighth day. Shmini Atzeret is a part of Sukkot or it's a holiday by itself? What do you think? The answer, it's a holiday by itself. It really should have been just like Shavuot is 50 days after Pesach 
שמיני עצרת should have been 50 days after Sukkot. Completely detached from Sukkot. That's why we say, oh, Shana, oh, Shana. What's oh, Shana? Na, Nun, Aleph, 51 days. 50 days between Sukkot to Shmini Atzeret. Why Hashem did not make Shmini Atzeret? Shmini Atzeret, is, Atzeret means everything stop. Atzeret, la Atzor. Atzor means stop. Shavuot is also called Atzeret. 50 days after Pesach, Atzeret. Same thing, Shmini Atzeret, Atzeret. But it's not 50 days after. The answer is because Hashem did not want to bother us too much. It's very hard to come to Jerusalem. We have to come from Tiberias, from Be'er Sheva, from uh, Tzfat. It takes two weeks to come with the horse, with the donkey, with your children. You have to get on a carriage to go between the trees. There's no electric at night, all kinds of bad animals. Now, finally, you came all the way to Bet HaMikdash. Two weeks to get there. One week you in the, you there in for Sukkot, you have parties, Simchat Bet HaShoeva, first Sukkot, last stop. You finish the holiday, two weeks to go back. So, Sukkot finish, by the time you get to Tzfat, it's two weeks. You have to turn right back and go back to Jerusalem. Two weeks to go back, why? Fifty days later, <laughs> You already have another holiday. So you have a week or one to two weeks to be with your family after you arrive to Tzfat. Now you have to get back with your children and go again to celebrate Shmini Atzeret for one day. It's very hard. Hashem is not so cruel to do it to us. So he attached Shmini Atzeret while you're already here. We'll do both in the same time. It's like when I go to my dentist over here, the tzaddik, Dr. Cohen, or the other tzaddik, Dr. Ovadia, because I come all the way from Monsi, he have mercy on me. He does two, three teeth in one shot. But he doesn't do it for residents of Queens. One tooth, come back next in two weeks. The nurse is asking him, what, you're going to do this also? You're going to do this also? Yes, he's coming from an hour and a half away. Why would I keep sending him back and forth? Let's do as much as we can. You get the idea or no? However, there's one problem here. You may ask, so why didn't Hashem do the same thing in Pesach? Should have made Shavuot attached to Pesach. Shvi shel Pesach, the next day, Shavuot. You're already in Bet HaMikdash. Why would I send you back home and then you have to come to for Shavuot again, 50 days later? which from the 50 days, 30 days is being on a road. So you have two weeks to be home. You get the idea or no? The answer is the weather. From Sukkot, it's starting to rain in Israel. That means when you go back, no problem. You're getting home, you get, you can, you'll be wet, no problem. You come home, you take a shower, you, get, you refresh yourself. But to go to Jerusalem, you're not in your house, you're sleeping in some tent, there's no showers, it's a big deal. You don't want to come for the holidays when it rain on you, on your children. So what happened? Pesach, there's no rain in Israel. No problem, enjoy the spring, wonderful weather, everything is blooming, all the trees. Enjoy the trip, get home, relax 20 days, and have another beautiful trip to Bet HaMikdash. Why? No rain. Don't worry. Ah, but Shmini Atzeret, it's already rain. If I make you come back again another month later, it's pouring rain already. So for that, Hashem had mercy on us. Now the question is, Rabotai, in all the holidays we say, Yom Chag HaPesach הזה. Yom, ha, Yom Chag HaMatzot הזה. Pesach in the Torah, it's called also Chag Pesach, but also Kol Chag Aviv, and also Kol Chag Amatzot. They have three names. Also Chag Acherut. So we say, Beyom Chag Asukot Aze, Beyom Chag Amatzot Aze, Beyom Chag Ashavuot Aze. Shmini Atzeret, we don't say Beyom Chag Shmini Atzeret Aze. We say Beyom Shmini Chag Atzeret Aze. 
שמיני חג, first you say שמיני, then you say חג, חג means holiday, חג It's something that moves in a circle, Chag, like an airplane, who goes in circles, it's called Chag, meaning goes in circles. Why we call the holidays Chag, circles? Because every year it finishes 365 days, the earth goes around the sun, and once the earth comes to the same place, that's where the holiday is going to be. So it's a full circle, 360 degrees. But in Shmini Atzeret, we first say, Beyom Shmini Chag Atzeret Aze. Why the Chachamim in the Tfila change the order? The answer is, because in other three festivals, we have other reasons to be happy. Other reasons to be happy. Sukkah, Arbat Aminim, all kinds of other things. Shmini Atzeret, there is nothing to be happy about besides the actual day itself. Nothing else. Just a day that Hashem say you must be happy. V'samachta b'chagecha v'aita ach sameach, ach sameach, you should be only happy that falls on Shmini Atzeret. This is the day that you must be the happiest in the year. And that's the day Hashem chose to give us this bloodshed and massacre that we had. How can it be? A day that should be the happiest became the saddest day in the last 50 years. So the answer is, one reason is, because once we are in a sukkah, we are protected. One of the things of the sukkah, it's anenea kavod. You are under the wings of Hashem. That's why the future to come when the goyim would come, the, go, the righteous goyim that would survive the final war, Gogu Magog, they will have mitzvah sukkah. They would have to come to Jerusalem, it's written in Aftara. The goyim that will survive, the nations, that would, the righteous goyim, will have to come to Jerusalem to celebrate sukkot. And the goyim that will refuse Righteous goyim, they survive the war. The wicked goyim are all wiped out. The wicked Jews are all wiped out. There is no more wicked le left in the world. Only righteous people. But some of those righteous Gentiles will refuse to come to Israel to celebrate Sukkot. And there will be another wave of strike by Hashem. And He will send them a pandemic. That's what the prophet wrote. הגויים האלה ימותו במגפה, they will die in a pandemic. Meaning, רבותיי, we are talking about goyim that survive a war that 5 billion people will die in 12 minutes. 5 billion in 12 minutes. That's what the Gaon Mivilna wrote. It's called two thirds of the people in the world, it's 5 billion. At least 5. And these goyim did not die in a 5 billion. How many goyim you have in the world? 8 billion. Jews, you have a crumb of a cookie. You know, a big cookie, chocolate chip cookie, uh, the black and white cookie, you know that huge cookie? One tiny crumb fell on the floor. You know anyone who looks for it with a magnifying glass? In the airport. What are you looking for? Your wife's diamond? No, no. One crumb fell from my son's cookie. You're looking for the crumb? Yeah. <laughs> That's the nation of Israel, that tiny cookie. Crumb. So... When you talk about the two-thirds of the people in the world, obviously it's two-thirds of the goyim. Two-thirds from eight billion, you're talking right there five billion. That means there will be more than two billion left. Two and a half, three. Still be a lot of righteous goyim. How can it be? You don't have so many righteous goyim in the world. The answer is, they are very evil ones like we saw now, but they are ones that are mediocre. They're not so bad. They, they talk to God. They were fooled by their parents to believe in JC and the rest of their nonsense. But they're not evil people. They will have a grace period of time to repent and leave their nonsense. And that's when Hashem will finally decide if they survive or not. It will, it will, the, the Navi, the prophet writes that Hashem will, will purify them like you pur purify the silver with fire. Some will burn. And some will make it. Same thing by us, the Jews. 
Jews, 20% will survive. And Gal Tietchem Acharit Kereshit, the Chachamim say, just like we came out of Egypt, 20% came out, 80% died. So the same thing, 20% will survive, 80% will die. We lost a thousand people in one day and we are devastated. We are crushed. Imagine if we will be righteous to be in that day, like the Bnei Israel when they came out of Egypt, almost every relative of them died. Think about it. Three million came out, 12 million died. So from every person that died, four died. For every person that came out, four died. It could be a person from a family that had 20 members, is the only one who came out and 19 died. And Hashem buried them in Egypt. They didn't go out to the desert. They didn't get the Torah, and they did not have the chance to become a part of the nation of Israel. Imagine if we live in those days that the prophet described in Gog and Magog, and we see every person we like, friends, family, parents, children, brothers, friends from work, friends from yeshiva even, one after the other is dying in such a horrible war. We will, will, will be completely crushed. For a thousand people, we are finished already mentally. Do you know what it means? And Galti etchem acharit kereshit. Now we have 15 million Jews in the world. Again, three million will survive. Twelve millions will die. That's what's written in the Navi, and that's what Chazal say. Acharit kereshit. That's what we say in a Musaf. In a, in a Musaf, we, in a Kedusha. Keter itenu lecha, what do we say? En gal tietchem acharit kereshit, liot lachem l'Elohim, ani Hashem elokechem, right? Acharit kereshit, the end, the final salvation, will be just like the first salvation. The salvation of Passover. One out of five. And that's exactly what's right now the situation in the, in the world is. Take 15 million Jews. How many of them are religious fully or partially? Three million the most. That's it. The rest have zero knowledge. Zero knowledge about Judaism and zero connection. And some mamash hate the religion and can't even say the word God next to them. Can't hear it. And when you see a party like this in the south on Yom Shabbat, on Simchat Torah, on Shmini Atzeret, the holy day, you see some Jews dancing around the Torah and some Jews dancing around the Buddha with no clothes, loaded with drugs. How can it not break you out? And again, I'm not saying or hinting that the reason that all of them were dead and kidnapped is because of that party. Probably not. Hashem doesn't kill someone for one incident. It's obvious, like I just explained before. The container, it may take years until it gets to the, to the top. One person told me on the way here today that in, op in his opinion, as bad as it looks, it's actually a gift to them, those who died, not those who were kidnapped. Those who were kidnapped are the most miserable right now on earth, no question about it. Those who died, got a bullet to the head, and in one second they died. That actually will save them from a lot of suffering. The one second suffering that they had, or, one, or five minutes until they got the bullet, obviously they were panicking, crying, screaming, begging for their life, so they had a, uh, few minutes of extreme suffering. Once the bullet goes to the head and they die, they don't feel anymore. The soul comes out of the body, and now it's peace, flying in space. Many of these people, that shot will actually save them from much, 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 much more suffering that was due to them. For all the Chilulei Shabbat, for all the other things that they did. Why? Because the Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin, page 47, Amud Mem Zayn in the bottom, the Gemara says, Anyone who died in a strange, unexpected, sudden death. 
unexpected. Young guy gets a heart attack. That's unexpected. It's not uh, routine things. Uh, fell from a roof. Lightning. Or a guy comes and stab him or shoot him or burn him or whatever they do. Any of that was not a natural way to die. Natural way, you get sick, you have a few months, and you die. That's natural. You old, you go to sleep, you don't wake up. That's natural. You know, people become old. You know that it's just a matter of time until the soul would leave the body. It's a natural way to die. To die in a natural way does not give you any credit. To die because you are Jewish, someone came and just killed you just because you are Jewish, you get a very big discount from your punishment that was due to you. It's not called metal kiddush Hashem, like many, many rabbis make that mistake again and again and again. That's incorrect. Some of them are big hachamim even. But when you make mistake, mistake is a mistake, doesn't matter who you are. Rabbi Akiva made a mistake. He thought Bar Kochva is the Mashiach. He told everyone, he's the Mashiach. The minute he died, Rabbi Akiva immediately got up and said, I was wrong all alone. He's not only not the Mashiach, he's a Rasha, he's a wicked person. They changed his name from Bar Kochva to Bar Koziva. Koziva comes from the word Kazav. Kazav in Arabic is Kadab. You know, they copy the language from us, the Arabs. Kazav, Kadab, similar. What does it mean? A crook, a deceiver. He deceived even me. But the difference between Rabbi Akiva and some of the Jews that live today and think that the Rabbi is the Messiah, even after he passed, is that their ego does not let them confess that they were wrong. After the Holy Rabbi passed, some of them admit it. Okay, I thought he's the Messiah. Apparently he's not, because if he passed, he's not the Messiah. No, it doesn't matter he passed. He can come from the dead. He still didn't really die. He's invisible. They have all these nonsense expressions. Rabbi Akiva was not a politician. I was sure that he's Mashiach. He died. He cannot be Mashiach. End of story. I was wrong. I was wrong. We have to learn to admit when we are wrong. And that's one of the hardest things. I once asked a question. What's harder? Two guys in yeshiva arguing about sugiyah in a gemara. Reuven and Shimon. Reuven knows all alone that Shimon has the truth on his side. Why he continue to argue for three hours and keep looking in 50 different books? What everyone say about the sugiya? Maybe he will dig one Rishon that thought like I think. Rambam, not like me. Rashba, not like me. Ran, not like me. Let's check. Tosfot, not like me. Rashi, not like me. Oh, I just found one. But everybody say I'm different. I have who to count on. The argument over there is not for the truth, it's for the ego. Who's gonna win the argument? If you're humble and down to earth, you know you have no problem to lose the argument. As long as the truth came out. Your friend was right, tomorrow you are right. You're right, I'm happy. Baruch Hashem, as, as long as we now know. We know who is right, we can continue to learn. So now, when you lost the argument, you now you have to admit to your friend that he was right. What's easier for you to say? It's easier to say, easier to say, you are wrong, I was wrong? Or it's easier to say, you are right? What's easier? To say to a person, Ata Tzodek, or to say, Ani Taiti? What's harder? To say, I was wrong, is a lot harder than to say, you are right. Why? Because when I say to him, you are right, it doesn't mean I'm wrong. I'm also right. You say it like Rashi, I say it like Tosfot. We're both right. But when you say I was wrong, that's no more doubt. 
I'm a loser, I lost the argument. So if you have ego, who can admit that he was wrong? If you don't have ego, you actually, people that don't have ego, not only they admit when they're wrong that they are wrong, even when they're right, they say, you're right, I was wrong. Let's move on. It makes you happy to be right. I'm, I'm, I'm for it. Why don't you fix him? I'll give you an example. The, the Magid Miduvna. He was in the generation of the Gaon Mivilna. He was the greatest speaker in Europe. The greatest. When he spoke, he had thousands of people coming from all over. Just like tonight. Thousands of people came to hear the greatest speaker in Europe. The Magid Miduvna one time arrived to town and nobody knew that he's in town. Now remember, people did not know how the rabbis look. There was no Google yet. You just know there is a big Chacham named Rambam in Egypt. There's a big Chacham, Rabbeinu Yonah. You, you just know about them. There's Rashi, the greatest Chacham in France. But you don't know how he looks. You just know about his writings. He would stand next to you in a supermarket, you wouldn't know who he is, especially when those Chachamim were doing everything they can to hide themselves. So now the Magid Mivduvna was in town on Shabbat. He did not tell anyone he came for Shabbat. And he see a big flyer, handmade. There was no printing yet. And they were printing, but they wouldn't waste it on that flyer. On Shabbat, the Magid Miduvna will give a big speech in a big synagogue. The Magid Miduvna said, how can it be? I did not tell one person that I'm coming to town. I did not make any plan to speak on Shabbat in a synagogue. Either the rabbi over there has Ruach HaKodesh, but he should have told me that I'm supposed to give a speech, no? So, this is the time to tell you that in the old days people used to pretend that they are someone else since nobody knew how the Chachamim look so if you knew a lot of Torah and you want a lot of audience to come you would say to the Gabbai of the Shul hi nice to meet you I'm the Maharsha you the Maharsha? yes wow what an honor I want to speak on Shabbat in a Shul of course we'll tell the whole community 5,000 people coming if you say, my name is Moshe Cohen, who are you? Avrech from the Kolel. I want to speak on Shabbat. Okay, we'll get five people and five cats to be mashlim minyan. Maybe Baruch Hashem, you'll have who to talk to. One speaker, one time was invited to speak in a place. And you know, in Israel, they pay the money to the speakers to come speak. It's organized. Because the, the city, they have a budget for culture. So synagogues get a little budget, so from that they pay the speakers to give them receipt, all this headache. So he comes to the place, he see one person sits in the audience, one. He said to him, I'm so honored you came. If you wouldn't come, the lecture would be canceled and I wouldn't get my thousand shekel. <laughs> Thanks to you, I'm getting paid for coming. I didn't come for nothing. So the guy said to him, excuse me, can you make the lecture short? I'm the next speaker after you. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning even one did not show up. <laughs> so the Gaon Mivil, the Magid Miduvna, he see a flyer that he speaks in a shul, he got curious. Let's see who is pretending to be me. He comes to the synagogue, 10,000 people, packed. One Chacham sits, by, sits on a stage. He begins to give a speech for one and a half hours. The Magid Duvna is sitting in the, in the audience and he see the one that is pretending to be him. For one and a half hours, he actually enjoyed the show. And that guy, everything he speaks is the words of the Magid Miduvna. He learned it in his books. And people actually think that it's him. He gets the hour of fame. That's all of a sudden, after an hour and a half, the real Magid Miduvna got up and said, excuse me, objection. <laughs> what? Who are you? I'm the Magid Miduvna. Ma? <laughs> he is the Magid Miduvna. No, it's, he's not. I am the real one. Remember, they didn't have ID. Can we see your driver's license? <laughs> Passport? No ID. 
So he said, wait a minute, the rabbi said, if you claim to be the Magid Miduvna, how is it possible you've been sitting here for an hour and a half and you let this pretender put such a fake show and you didn't say a word about it? What's the answer? What's the answer? What would you answer if you were the, the, the real Magid Miduvna? What's the reason he didn't contest him in the first minute? Exactly. He said, as long as he say the truth and encourage and inspire people, I will stop such an event. What do I care? People are becoming more stronger in the Torah. I'm happy. Once he make mistakes in my name, that's a different story. That's what should be. Ah, I disagree. The truth of the Torah is above everything. That's when he got up. So they say, how would we know who is the Magid Miduvna? So he said to the rabbi, you choose any two verses from the Tanakh that are completely not relevant to each other. I will give you over an hour speech about them and connect them. And ask him if he can do the same thing. <laughs> After five minutes. Everyone knew who is the real diamond and who is the cubic zirconia. <laughs> you got the point? So Rabotai, just before we finish, time, and time ended, I just want to conclude. One, was one final suggestion, suggestion, good thing I wrote it down not to forget. I have two warnings to give you and we finish right here. What are the two warnings? First one, you have to be very careful whenever there is a massive tragedy, there is a lot of fakers who opens all kinds of donation request pages claiming they're helping the Israeli soldiers or the hospital, all baloney, nine out of 10 are crooks. They steal the money. Even when they show you a widow in Israel that just her husband died, for real, you can check that the husband died. And she has 10 kids, and they make a fund that they collect for that widow. If they collect $100,000, maybe, maybe if she's lucky, she's gonna get 5,000 out of it. The people who are Askanim, they put their money in their pockets, commission. That's why, take my advice, never ever donate to large bombastic organizations. As good as they are, 80% of your money will go to the garbage. They have people, drivers, advertisement, buildings, rents, cars, first class that they fly, restaurants, events, trips, whatever you can imagine. You do not want to sponsor that. You want to sponsor, sponsor giving birth. You want to sponsor yeshiva. You want to sponsor uh, uh, saving souls. Once you have an organization with buildings and workers and secretaries and dinners and events, and then when they fly from country to another, it's 20 people all sit in a business class. Each one of them is more than $5,000 a ticket. One trip can be $100,000. They don't care, it's not their money. And most of the time, it runs by people that have no irat shamay. That's why, without saying any names, no organizations. You want to you sponsor? Spon sponsor to someone you trust, you know that the money will go really for the yeshiva, or if you know someone who sits and learns Torah, is poor, give him directly the money. Why do you need middlemen? That's one thing. Second thing, I want to warn every one of you, I know by now it's too late because it's already three days, not to open all these videos that people send you on WhatsApp from the disaster. I know it's too late. I should, if I had a lecture a minute after, I would warn you there. But better late than never, because it destroyed your subconscious, destroys you. You are curious. Every video that people send you, especially if it has a juicy title, immediately you want to see what happened. When your brain sees this massive tragedy, that they burn a woman, that they, they put kids in cages, that they take old people and make fun of them and beat them up, 
All these things make a huge impact on your subconscious. And it creates stress, depression, anxiety, panic attacks, sweat, constipation, lots of other mental problems. You do not see it immediately, but it makes the brain go into panic mode, because the brain doesn't know what the video is. Remember, when Hashem created us, there's no video. Whatever your, your eyes see, it's reality. There's no way to see fiction until 50, 100 years ago. There was no screens, there's no movies, there's no clips. Everything a person saw, it's reality. So if you saw people being murdered, it's reality. People are really being murdered. It's not a movie in Hollywood that it's fake. The brain cannot tell the difference between real and the fake. Even if you see a fiction movie and they throw someone from the terrace, or they burn a person, or all these horrible things that they do in the movies, the brain is thinking we are now in a time of a tragedy, time of stress, time of war is going into a panic mode. Panic mode creates a lot of problems. A lot of problems. It makes the hair gray, it makes you lose hair, it makes a lot of other problems. It makes you have no patience for your kids, it makes you be extra angry. A lot of things happen because you are in a panic mode. When you're in a panic mode, you can kill someone for asking a question, because you're very nervous. Especially now when you see all these clips and you see our brothers and sisters going through the biggest nightmare you can imagine, all these things are accumulating a subconscious and affect the choices we make from now until the day we die. So it's not good to see these things, not good at all. The more tragedies and things you see, the more problems you're gonna have. And plus one last thing, it creates it creates another problem, lack of empathy. You get used to violence. It becomes a way of life. You're not even excited anymore. By the Arab culture, because they constantly murder even each other all the time, they just grew up with that from age zero. From age zero, they give them guns in kindergarten, eat bachel yaud, kill Jews, they show them all kinds of things, they brainwash their kids, that's why they become such monsters. That's why they're able to do what they do. A normal, decent European will not be able to do such thing. A different, decent Arab from a normal place that grew up religious without this murder is not gonna be able to do such thing. Those jihadis, those monsters, that their parents were monsters and the grandparents were monsters, they raised them to, be, just like they take a dog, they want the dog to be a wild beast. From a very young age, they give him raw meat to eat, full of blood and they starve him, and then they give him raw meat, or they, uh, they send him on a person to attack. That's how they train them. Why is it? This is how it's like, a rob rob like you program a robot. So once you see so many tragedies, that's it. After a while, the panic system of the body does not react anymore. You don't care anymore about anything. Five minutes after you see the biggest tragedy in history, you tell a jokes and you see it and you eat and it's like nothing happened. Don't have. I remember once uh, Rav Victor Miller Zatzal said, what happened, you get a lot of envelopes to the house. A widow, family got uh, lost their children, um, all, all kinds of disaster. Someone with cancer about to die, this, that, all kinds of things. We can't give donation to 5,000 people every month. I mean, they send these envelopes every day. You go to the mail, this one, Tom Kishabes, that one, this one, this union, this shul, this synagogue, building mikveh, widow, orphans, that. What are you gonna do? So sometimes what happens is you take it and you don't even open it. You see it's collecting, throw it to the garbage. So Rav Avigdor Miller say, okay, obviously Hashem doesn't expect you to give 5,000 donations if you are, yourself needs donation. What are you going to give them, a penny? But throwing it to the garbage, it's cruelty. Why? If I cannot give, how is it going to help the widow that I open the letter and throw it then to the garbage? 
What difference does it make? It says on the envelope, widow with 15 kids, lost her husband in a young age, she needs our help. You know you're in a negative balance in your bank account. There's nothing you can do. So you take it, you don't even open it. You see like on the, on the envelope, you don't read the letter, you throw it to the garbage. That's a crime. Do you ever think it's a crime? Why it's a crime? Because the Torah obligates every Jew to care about his brothers and sisters that are in a time of trouble. No se ba'olim chavero. So if you cannot help financially, there is still one more way that you can help. Open the Tehilim and read three, four chapters of Tehilim for this widow. Shema, you know I cannot give her anything. Let me read a few chapters of Psalms. Ezrat Hashem, you have extra mercy on her and help her to get what she needs. That shows that you care about the pain of others. You cannot, the Gemara says, Best of the doctors automatically go to hell. Of course, that's an exaggeration. Some doctors go to heaven and they don't even go one minute to hell if they're righteous. But that's a general statement. Every rule has an exception to the rule. Meaning if you have a hundred doctors, few of them will go to heaven, don't worry. Just being a doctor doesn't send you express to hell. But the Gemara make it as a statement. Just like the Torah says, Ishmael pere Adam. But you have some Arabs that are wonderful people. But you see the rest, what they do. So there is a general rule and there is an exception to the rule. So why the Gemara makes such a severe, strict statement that automatically all doctors automatically go to hell. By the way, it's also said about lawyers. Tov Sheba'uch Edin also lagenu. Why is it? The answer is, doctors and lawyers have one thing in common. What is it? They deal with miserable people that their life are is in serious danger right now. Either they can go to jail or they can get executed or they lose all their property. It's a time of stress. Or they're very sick, cancer, heart, heart problems. Because the doctors and the lawyers are so used to deal with miserable people, they already take their pain for granted. They can care less. That's why you can go to a hospital and you see the doctor is working on a computer in a hallway and in a room right next to him, some old men scream, I, I, help me, I'm dying. Yeah. Check his messages. It's like, Excuse me, the, this guy needs help. Don't worry, we know what we're doing here. Doesn't bother him. Every passenger that passed by <laughs> go crazy. I wish I can help him, I'm not a doctor. Excuse me, do you mind? Don't tell us how to do our job. There's no problem. It's just girl, his girlfriend just called. Hi, how are you? Where are we going to eat dinner tonight? The person is screaming for help. Who cares? Why is it? He became used to it. He got used to it. He, 20 years he hear people screaming. At one point it stopped bothering him. Same thing with these videos. You get used to the horror. Either it will destroy you mentally or would make you immune. Either way is dangerous. If it will destroy you mentally, it's worse. Because now your life can be over. You cannot get married, you're afraid, you have all kinds of uh, traumas. It can make you, you know, a psycho. A psycho, serial killer, a pervert, all kinds of things like this, pedophile, where these things come to people. It's a scar in a nefesh, in a, in a subconscious that creates this problem. So if it did not mess you up, it made you cold as ice. You can care less. You see people are dying, people are asleep. You don't even have one tear. Don't cry. Like nothing happened. That makes Hashem very upset. People just die and you want to go on vacation? What's wrong with you? 
I remember, and Mamash, Bemet, I will finish with this one minute story. I remember Rabbi Adere told the story 25 years ago and it did not leave my head one week since then. That story. That's how much it affected me. He said that after the Holocaust, there were a few boats bringing survivors from Germany on Poland to the United States. And there were already a Jewish community in Lower East Side. You know, the first Jews who came in the 1800, they came to Seaport. They came out of the suitcase with some cash, started to buy downtown, Allen Street, all these streets, East Broadway, Grand, all these places in the Lower East Side. Then they crossed the bridge and went to Borough Park and other places, Williamsburg. In the beginning, it was Lower East Side. It was all ultra-Orthodox neighborhood, lots of synagogues. I remember when I lived for a few months over there, I was davening by a shul called Hasidim de Polin. This was funded in the 1800s, this shul, small shtibol, and there were gemara in a top shelf, huge gemara with yellow pages, printed in the 1700, 1785. You touch the page, it becomes powder. That's how dry they are. Nobody touched them. They're there already for generations, for grandfather of grandfather. Big, huge, primitive gemarot with the old printing. This is how it was. So he said that after the Holocaust, a boat with survivors arrived to seaport. And the Jews in America, they were already very established. 70, 75 years ago, a lot of them were very rich already, own hotels, real estate. So when they arrive waiting for the boat to dock, to go to the, to the port, their relatives were waving, you know, with the white hats. Remember those days? The Jews lived in uh, Coney Island. Before Boropa, Coney Island, there was one of the Jewish communities, and Lower East Side, Chicago. They waved to them, hi, Uncle Harry. I wish you would come a week earlier. Now, this is people who lost all their families. They came from Auschwitz. They look like skeleton, like this tripod. Their life is messed up forever. And they see their cousins, Sometimes brothers went to America before the Holocaust and made a lot of money. And they all dress with nice clothes, suits, top of the line. And they wave to them, Hi, I wish you would come and a week earlier. We just had a wedding in the Plaza Hotel. They talk to them before they get them to the... So he said there were Jews that were so frustrated that they just found out that while they were getting burned and abused and destroyed in Auschwitz, their relatives were having their life here in the United States, enjoying getting fatter by the minute, enjoying what the world has to offer, while their family is being completely destroyed. So it, they took out their tefillin, one guy threw it into the water, and everybody else took the tefillin and threw the tefillin into the water. They just don't, didn't want to leave anymore. Maybe what they just found out when they arrived here to New York was the biggest killer for them, even when they were still in Europe, to find out that while they were being destroyed, their old brothers and sisters and cousins enjoying life here in America. You may say, look, there was no communication, no telephones. We only knew about it from the newspaper a little here and there. You can find excuses. Plus, you, when you don't see something in front of your eyes, it's not as effective. Excuses we can find plenty. But that's the story I can never forget. That's what the Torah says, no se ba'olim chavero. And you want to hear something unbelievable? Who is the biggest monster in the last thousand years in the world. For sure, maybe in the history of the world. But the last thousand years of the planet, who is the biggest monster? 
Huh? היטלר, right? I want to agree. היטלר, יימח שמו וזכרו. He's the devil himself, basically. There is anything positive to learn from Hitler? One, anything positive? Leadership, you can learn from a lot of other things. Why to learn from this monster? Learn from Bennett, leadership. <laughs> oh, baby. Listen, listen carefully. Imach Shimo v'zichro, when the Russians were beating them up, killing them, these Germans, that's it, it was their end, the last month of their, before they surrender. He went to the dentist to have a root canal. Root canal is very painful. The doctor was about to give him anesthesia. He said to him, no, do it without it. So are you serious? You know how painful it is, root canal without uh, shots? Need two, three shots. Do it, I want to scream, I want to suffer. He asked him why. He said, my soldiers are dying now for Germany, fighting these Russians. And I'm going to lay here on your leather couch and getting anesthesia? I want, I want to have sympathy with them. They suffer in the freezing weather there, in the snow fight, fighting these Russian Cossacks. I want to suffer here, in the nice dentist office. Sounds silly, but it bothered him that he's laying there in a nice office, being taken care of by the doctor, while his soldiers are being killed by the Russians. I should also, also feel the suffering. A monster like this, was able to think, why should my soldier suffer and I enjoy here? And we, the children of God, will see our brothers and sisters suffering and it won't bother us, and we move back to our steak a minute later like nothing happened. What would you like for dinner, sushi? Do you get the point or no? There is an obligation to the Torah, no se ba'ol im chavero. Share the weight with your friend. Friend has a hundred pound on his back, run to take 50 from him. 50 and 50 is a lot easier. 100 on him will kill him. 50 on him, 50 on you, both of you will survive. Bezrat Hashem, we are in the middle of a war. People ask me what should we do. One is read a lot of Tehillim and say for the safety of our soldiers who fight to keep us safe in the Holy Land. When you do Misha Berach for the soldiers, add always and Bezrat Hashem, Hashem will keep them safe and protect them and make them successful and make them Baalei Tshuva. You must make it. Why? Because technically you're not allowed to do, to give a Bracha for someone that is Mechalel Shabbat. No matter how great of a soldier he is. So therefore, in the middle of the Bracha, to be safe, you also bless him that he should be Tzadik. I'm giving him bracha, that he should be tzaddik, and Hashem will keep him and, and help him to become Baal Tshuva. And of course, in order for him to be Baal Tshuva, he has to stay alive. You understand? So, it's very important to read Tehillim and when we pray, to ask Hashem for, for salvation, and of course, to increase the learning more and more Torah, and stop watching all this news and all this, it's breaking the heart. How, what good is that to find out that another 20 or 30 or 50 soldiers just died? What for? We already know we're in a serious problem. Et Sarai Yaakov, and Bezrat Hashem, umimena Ivashea. Baruch Adonai Amen ve'amen. Rabbi